wait a second, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. You know, we got a grand rounds here at Harvard. We got it all financed by by Lawrence Rockefeller. Let's go get it. And he kept going, no, no, we really we really need to try to settle this thing. And I said, you know, I didn't want to fire him or anything, but he, he kept on going behind my back and trying to talk, uh, talk John into it. What did John, like, did you ever have conversations with him about what he theorized this was? Like, did he have a thought like, oh, these are future humans. Oh, these oh. are aliens visiting from somewhere else. What did he think? He, he spent an awful lot of time reflecting upon this, trying to figure out what, what this really was. Uh, and, uh, and John, uh, John uh, started out uh, assuming that they were like extraterrestrial, that they were like from some other planet. You know, somewhere, and so he kept on probing this thing, and he kept doing more and more research about it, and interviewing more and more people. And then he started interviewing a lot of uh, Aboriginal people, Aboriginal. Uh, ab Aboriginal people down in South America and stuff that were in the jungles and stuff that thought they had encountered some of these beings. He, he interviewed Native American people, and he started getting this sense that there was this uh, this uh, uh, this uh, kind of shamanic dimension mm. to this whole thing that that these beings it may not be as simple as they just come from another planet somewhere on these craft uh -huh. but that they that they that they they've got some kind of a shamanic uh dimension to them uh and uh, and then he started deciding look at it, it's absolutely essential that that i not try to impose upon them any conclusion about exactly what's going on here or else i'm never going to really find That's out right. what, what's going on and so he immediately starts into this kind of rogerian uh, uh carl rogers is one of the uh, psychiatrist who's got this theory that you never you're never directive when you're uh, when you're interviewing uh, in right. the, the people and just let them talk and, and listen to them and and don't judge them don't don't try to attack them don't make them feel guilty about what they're experiencing so you can try to unload what it is they're saying determine whether you think it's some kind of a Jungian archetype that's going on in them or whether they're having a real experience. You know, and so he he got into this kind of very uh, Rogerian uh, kind of passivity about you know uh, making any judgments about what they were or where they came from or how real this was, uh, and and so he started uh, he started moving. In fact, he was taking kind of a a self protective position, which was genuine, trying to explain to the people on the panel. Look, he says, I'm not saying. I'm not saying anything about this, uh, about exactly how it was true, but I, I can tell you the people were completely sincere about it, you know, the, and, the, and the, I can just tell you that, you know, that we ran all the different tests on the people and they were all, otherwise they were all completely normal psychologically, and yet they were having this kind of experience. He said, and I, I began to do things like I would ask them questions when they were doing the holotropic breathing and all of a sudden they find themselves aboard this craft and he starts asking them questions like, well, what can you see there? You know, what's it look like? You know, are there, are there any instruments around? What do they look like? And he was getting them to describe the kind of equipment inside, <laughs> inside the UFOs and he was doing this kind of full-scale like investigation to try to figure out what, what was going on and he was thunderstruck by the similarity of all this information. Yeah, well, I, one of the things that's always crazy to me is when you look at the history of even just 20th century alone sightings so yeah. beyond just what we're talking about right now these are different countries different people of different backgrounds different ages before internet before there could be That's you right. know some behind the scenes coordination and they describe many of the same thing that's right and i'm sure that had to right. play with uh, just really fuck with the mind of of, of a of a john mack type yeah. guy who's looking at this more than anyone else yeah he, he just said look at there's something really uncanny about this uh, and so he decided that's why he wanted to write the article and he was going to write the article he said this is something that we need to share with the with the psychiatric community to try to figure out whether we can figure out what's happening here yeah. And then they come down on him like a load of bricks, you know, and uh, I end up getting brought in. And so I end up starting to meet all these people. And, and so I ended up uh, saying, look, at, let's, let's present to the, to the Harvard faculty all the information, the witnesses and stuff that we have. Uh, and I had to have a local council. Uh, I, I brought on a local council, this, this fellow, um, uh, uh, Anyway, that uh, I, I went over. I went over to talk to uh, Lawrence Tribe, 
my constitutional law professor, just if he could recommend somebody as local counsel. And I talked to Al Dershowitz, who who I'd had, and uh, and uh, Al, Al like the yeah, Alan Dershowitz. Alan Dersh- and Al Al recommended uh, Harvey uh, Harvey Silverstein, and I called Harvey to see if he would be local counsel. He was in the middle of a big trial, so he he recommended this this kid uh, 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 Eric. Um, what's his name? Uh, uh, McLeish, Eric okay. McLeish, uh, and Eric and Eric was just young, young kid, you know, and I said, look, all you got to do is just, you know, be local counsel because I'm admitted in New York and in Washington, DC, but I'm not admitted here. Uh, and so he agreed to do it. Uh, and then Eric, right from the very beginning, kept on trying to figure out how to settle the case. Kept on saying, oh, "Wait a second, let's get out of this thing. Let's make this go away. Let's let's make." And and I, I kept saying, "Wait a second, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. You know, we got a grand rounds here at Harvard. We got it all financed by by Lawrence Rockefeller. Let's go get." It. And he kept going, "No, no, we really we really need to try to settle this thing." And I said, "You, know, I didn't want to fire him or anything, but he he kept on going behind my back and trying to talk uh, talk John into." And of course, Sally, his wife, wanted to get rid of this thing. Sally was just, it was ruining her life. You know, I mean, they stopped inviting them to social events at Harvard. They stopped, you know, stopped inviting them to John's people's wife. Oh, yeah. They, I mean, they just kind of, he was kind of getting ostracized by the entire Harvard community. You know, and when I was talking to Dersh and and and, uh, and uh, Larry and the other guys, they were all going, oh, it's too bad. You know, John's going through some sort of midlife crisis. <laughs> and I, I talked to Alan Stone. Alan Stone's a good friend of mine. Alan Stone was the head of the McLean Institute, you know, there, and he taught the course on uh, psychology and the law at mm-hmm. Harvard. And so I had, I had taken the course before, so I knew about a lot of this stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, they were all saying, they were saying, oh, poor John, you know, he's going through some midlife crisis. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, uh, and they, they were totally unsympathetic, you know, and the, the whole faculty was completely unsympathetic to him. But this is something he continued it to, to the last day of his life. I've absolutely stuck up. absolutely stuck with it, you know, and wrote a second book called Passport to the Cosmos, where he actually talks about how how uh, inchoate this whole thing is. It's not really clear what's going on, how much of it is psychological, how much of it is archetypal stuff. And of course, we ended up, you know, talking to people like Jacques Vallée, you know, and, uh, and, and re- read this stuff by Carl Jung. I mean, Carl Jung actually had this entire theory that, uh, that the UFOs are, in fact, a, uh, a photoplasmic projection into actual material manifestation of a deep unconscious fear that our whole species has about our, our direction in the future mm. of going toward Whoa. more and more, uh, uh, you know, losing our compassion, losing our emotions, becoming more and more technical and, you know, becoming more and more atrophied because of our lack of exercise. You know, the Jung, Jung goes into this big, long deal. Uh, I mean, an actual photoplasmic projection into actual material manifestation of a deep uh, abiding fear of our of our future, you know. And so we had to entertain all of these things, you know, to put them up in front of us and try to mm-hmm. evaluate wh- what the different theories were, you know. And, and, Je- and David Jacobs was just beside himself about how horrible it was these abductions that were going on, that they were engaged in this uh, this clear uh, uh, breeding program, you know, of taking the egg cells out of the women that were abducted and sperm cells from the men, and that they were combining their own DNA with these and generating children. I mean, all true. It's all true. The, the, how do you know that's true? Because I've talked to a dozen people in the details about how the, what who, the things they went like, through. Like, did, oh, okay, so people who actually claim that that happened. Oh, yeah. Did they have children that they... That they they, that had, they thought they were had, inseminated they, by aliens. They, they had, well, for for example, Karen, this one woman, she gets abducted, <clears throat> and uh, she's uh, she doesn't have any recollection of what happened to her, but she ends up you know, losing this time. She ends up uh, going and 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 uh, end up talking to John, and she goes through this regression and gets back to realizing that she's been abducted, uh, and that they did this operation on her, and they removed some of the li- the live eggs from her, mm-hmm. uh, and that uh, they. Uh, then uh, all of a sudden, she, when she woke back up the, the next day, she was pregnant mm-hmm. and she hadn't been with anybody for like two years, uh, you know, and so she was completely puzzled by this. So she goes to the obstetrician and they verify that she's pregnant. Uh, she carries the, the, the baby all the way to the thir- end of the first trimester for three full months. Uh, she's going to the doctors and, and taking care of herself. Then all of a sudden she gets abducted again uh, and then she's not pregnant. How did she get abducted again? 
she just she was in her she was in her living room and all of a sudden she said the hair the hair started standing up on her arms and in the back of her neck and she started getting this really kind of electric feeling uh, and all of a sudden here are these three little guys standing in the middle of the room uh, and ended up picking her up and taking her with them you know and she went through the details and uh, they brought her on board and uh, she didn't remember the details but she had some sort of an operation they removed the 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 three month old zygote. You know, and Psycho. she, yeah, it was a, it was a a, a a child that was starting to be to be grown, and that they, and then she she was furious about this, of course, uh, and she, uh, the next time they showed up, she started throwing things at them. She threw a chair at them and a lamp at them, and kind of kicked one of them, knocked him down, you know, and uh, and they were doing this thing, uh, and so she ended up. Uh, John started talking with her because she'd been abducted a number of times. And so we had we had designed this program, John and I, and talking about it, uh, about the, the people who are repeat uh, abductees. We said, wait a second. What we can do is we can help train these people uh, to be kind of really calm down. You know, do the holotropic breathing when you think when, <laughs> when you think this thing is starting to happen. Just calm down, take a lot of deep breaths, and wait. We, 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 and so we're going to set up like this diplomatic corps. When you see an alien, yeah, yeah. just count just, to five. Just count, okay, yeah, take deep breaths. <laughs> you know, and, and so it was true. So we had this whole thing figured out. And Karen was oh a, was a, was a great prospect. And so we said, look, let's let's uh, see if we can get Karen trained to do this. So Karen did it, and she goes through this whole process of doing the holotropic breathing, et cetera, because she was so upset about what had happened. Uh, and so the next time it happened, all of a sudden she starts getting the hair standing up on her arms and stuff, and she starts doing the holotropic breathing. Uh, and all of a sudden, these three little dudes show up in her in her living room, right? And so, she, and, and, you know, they're doing this, you know, thing, <laughs> like, waiting to get hit with a lamp or something. And she's just kind of mellow and centered uh, and, and starts having these telepathic communications with them. And they were kind of impressed by how she kind of mellowed about this. And they actually brought her with them, uh, brought, her up, brought her up onto the craft and brought her uh, had her take off all of her clothes, get in this pool, this kind of gelatin uh, pool that they had is this aqua colored stuff. And she had to get down underneath it and breathe it in and fill her lungs in with it and stay under the thing. And they took her with them uh, and they brought her to where their planet was, she said. To their yeah. planet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as far as she could tell, all she knows is she was under that and it was like some period of time she stayed under there. And then when they, they got there and they took her up out of the pool and she tossed up, threw up all this stuff. And then they, they brought her in through this little, like almost like a thing when you're getting off like an airplane like yeah, thing. Like and they, they brought her into a, the kind of this room and there was her little girl and she was like, like three years old. Uh, her little time, girl. Her little. She knew instantaneously that this was her child, uh, and it was a that as, they had it, removed. That, that's right. That's right. And they brought the the child to term, and the little child was like three years old. She and had, the child looked like a human. She she was a kind of really kind of big 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 dark eyes, uh, very thin uh, stringy kind of hair. You know, big kind of a large head, uh, but she was a combination between the human oh being God. and the thing, and the and she and she, but she recognized right away that it was her daughter, uh, and she hugged her and, and carried her around and, and cooed her and talked with her for a, the whole day, uh, and then they brought her back, you know. But she actually got to see her daughter. Well, I asked you what John Mack thought these were, but you've talked with all these people too, and you've yes. been doing this for so many years. What do you think this is? Do you think? Do you think these are from another planet? Yeah, do you think it's I, future I, I humans? Think, I, I, no, I think this is real simple. You know, uh, th this is this is like you know Occam's razor. You know, we we know that there's that you know that there's now now we know that there's not just one hundred billion stars in our in our system. They 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 put up the Hubble and they realized that there were two hundred billion stars yeah. in, in our thing. Then they then they put up the the Planck thing. They realized that there were three hundred billion stars. Now with the with the the uh, James Webb thing, they know there's like a five hundred billion star systems yeah. in our in our galaxy okay uh, and that they've all got planets they're they're sure that they've all got planets now they're virtually certain that they've all got planets and the 20 percent of them have got planets in the in the uh, the uh, the so-called Goldilocks area area you know and that 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 uh, some portion of them have generated life obviously so there's other intelligent civilizations and you give them five six billion years more to work on superluminal flight and so they can fly here. 
Yeah. You know, so they can come and go. You know, you you don't have to you don't have to get really super complicated about the whole thing. You know, this is sort of like a bus transport operation going on here. You know, and they're coming and going, uh, and they've set up bases here on our planet. Uh, and the, our planet, our planet uh, is one of the comparatively few planets that actually gestates life. You know, and it's it's a valuable resource. Uh, life, life is a, a valuable resource. Mm. That they that they take life from our our planet and they plant it in other in other star systems and stuff. You know that this is going on. I mean, it sounds it sounds remarkable. But, of course it does. But but oh, but, crazy, but, but but the but the bottom line is it's a pretty simple you know Occam's razor explanation for what it is that's going on. Now there's a lot of other things that are conflated with it. How so? The, the, you know, for example, the, you know, Marian apparitions and and uh, people believing that they see angels and uh, people see, they see Bigfoot. You know, there's all kinds of other things going on that are that are strange. There are anomalous situations that are going on. You know, uh, and, and some people think there are such things as ghosts. You know, that people's paranormal uh, stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah, paranormal stuff. And and that what they do is they conflate this with what is. Basically, a, a comparatively prosaic event that's really going on here, you know. And so that we're uh, we're focusing on this one, you know. This this is an extraordinary event that's taking place. It's a trans historic event. Uh, it's our it's our journey into the stars. It's our becoming part of a galactic civilization, you know. And there are lots of other of these things going on around. And I don't disparage those things, but I don't say, you know, please spare, spare me all the talk about, you know, the Skinwalker Ranch, you know, and, and Bigfoot and, and all these things. That it's are, a distraction. It, you it's, what, no, what I'm saying is, is that, that you just stay focused on these things that, that you know, I, I've interviewed dozens and dozens and dozens of people. Uh, about this ph other phenomenon, uh, and it's pretty pretty straightforward. What's going on? You know, in the, that they're that the, forty percent of the people that you interview talk about being telepathically warned about nuclear weapons. That this is this is going to destroy the life generating right. capacity of your planet. And, you know, you're going to destroy your entire your entire species. Thank you for watching the video, guys. If you haven't already subscribed, please smash that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.